Hi, my name is Nigel Cohen. Welcome to week seven of the Sunshine course on accounting. This week's session is the balance sheet principles. In fact, last week we dealt with the balance sheet principles as well. Uh, it was more called preparing the balance sheet. It's just that the concepts are so critical to accounting and it's so important to understand exactly what it means that this week uh, we're going to delve into more detail about some of those concepts and trying to bring them to life to deepen your understanding. So you may remember last week we talked about accounting periods. Accounting periods are at the heart of what balance sheet accounting is all about. We talked about the matching concept. This is where you match your revenues with your costs. You match the accounting periods. And then we created the balance sheet. That's what we did last week. And so this week, we're going to really repeat the same uh, material. It's just that we're going to go into it into a little bit more detail with a little bit more illustration. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the timing of the transactions, just to repeat what we talked about last time, talk about the accounting balances, and then we're going to illustrate the concepts both with stock and with fixed assets. And then we're going to just briefly touch on balance sheet formats again. And hopefully at the end of this session, you'll have a much better feel and feel much more confident about preparing balance sheets. So the account timing of transactions and the accounting balances are really quite connected. So this is an example of a, of a car trader, that's someone who buys cars and sells them over a three month period, January, February, and March. But what I want to try and do is to bring to life this concept of accounting periods uh, and uh, to illustrate how the matching is such a significant part of what we're doing, both in terms of the profit and loss account, but also the balance sheet. So in this example, we sell 10 cars all in February, and we sell each car for 1,500 pounds. So the total sales revenue is one, uh, 15,000 pounds over the three month period, but all of that money comes in February. It's just that we've got a slightly different period as to when we buy the cars. So although we sell 10 cars in, Jan in February, we actually bought two of those 10 cars in January. So if you look at January alone, it looks that we bought two cars. If you imagine a lot of other transactions wrapping around this so that those two cars get a bit confused, on the face of it, we'll show purchases of 2000 pounds, which will reduce our profits and if we had no other assets or liabilities, no other sales or costs during the period, it would look on the face of it as if we've lost £2,000. In the month of February, when we've sold 10 cars, two of them we bought in January, but five of them we bought in February. So if we're just looking in February in isolation, just February, it looks like we've sold 15,000 pounds of cars. We only paid 5,000 pounds for the cars. So on the face of it, it looks in February as if we made profits of 10,000 pounds. When actually what happened was three of the cars we bought in February, but we didn't pay for them until March. So of our 10 cars that we sold in February, two came through to us in January, five came through to us in February, and three we paid for in March. And this is a great example to illustrate what we mean by matching. Instinctively, it's pretty obvious that if you sell 10 cars in February for 15,000 pounds, you need to account for costs of all of those 10 cars and in this case, that's 10,000 pounds. So what instinctively we know we should have profits of 5,000 pounds, the sales of 10,000, less the cost of, sorry, sales of 15,000 pounds, less the cost of 10,000 pounds, there's our profit 
of 5,000 pounds. But actually, on the face of it, in our uh, cash flows, our cash flows in January show 2,000 pounds going out. In February, it shows 10,000 pounds coming in. And in March, it shows 3,000 pounds going out. And this is essentially what a balance sheet is all about. A balance sheet is the mechanism by which we move the purchase of two cars in January into February. And similarly, the cars that we bought, we paid for in March, we bring those back to February as well. And in that way, we're going to match the sales of 10 cars with the, with the purchases of 10 cars all in the same month. And as I said, the balance sheet is the mechanism by which we effect that transition. So I'm now going to show you an example. Because I think examples are by far the easiest way to see and to understand these things. So this spreadsheet simply shows exactly what the slide showed just beforehand. It shows the 10 cars sold in February, but we paid for two cars in January, five cars in February, and three cars in March. So clearly what's happened in January when we bought the two cars, if you look at the figures at the end of January, we have two cars in stock. And of course, the reason for that is if someone comes in on the 1st of February and they want to buy a car, we have to have cars in stock to do so. So we bought the, the cars in February in January, so we've got stock to sell when it starts when we come to February. And as people come in and buy cars from us, we start to run out very quickly, so we have to buy more cars. And actually, if we've already got a stock of two and we've sold 10, we've had to buy eight cars but we've managed to persuade our supplier to wait for payment for three of the cars. And it could be that we're being paid, we're worried that we won't be paid for the cars on time. So our supplier has said they're very happy to help us out. So as at the end of February, even though we've sold the cars, we've received them from the supplier and sold them, we've, we've received the cars from our supplier at the end of February, we just haven't paid for them. And so the balance sheet item as at the end of February is that we owe money to our supplier, it's a creditor. So our balance sheet item is at the end of January is that we've got 2000 pounds worth of stock. And that's the mechanism by which we transfer the assets that we bought before the period into February. So we buy the stock in January and we release it to the accounts in February. But at the end of February, we owe £3,000. We owe for three cars. So we have creditors and our creditor is the mechanism by which we bring the liability that we're going to pay next month into this month's costs. So I'm just going to show what that looks like in the table. So I've got the um, physical transactions happening on the left. And in accounting terms, the way we represent this is we show the stock movements in the right-hand column, movements of the month, called the physical car stocks. And you'll see the stock at the start of the month in January, we had none. We bought two cars, which means we've got stock at the end of the month of two cars. So at the beginning of the February, those same two cars at the beginning of February is simply the figure from the end of January. We've got those two cars. We bought in a further five cars, but we sold 10, which means we apparently have a negative stock of three cars. And that's an indication that something's gone wrong. So as at the end of beginning of March, we've got the same three cars stock at the beginning of March, but we bought a further three. So we've got nothing at the end of the period. And if you look at the overall totals for the three months, it shows we started off with no stock. We bought 10 cars, we sold 10 cars. So we've ended up with no stock at the end of the period. And in terms of cash flows, 
at the beginning of January, we've received, during the month of January, we've received no money because we've not sold anything, but we bought two cars, so we paid out £2,000. In the month of February, we've received £15,000 for the three car, for the 10 cars that we sold. We paid for a further five, which means we've got cash inflows of £10,000, and we pay for the final £3,000 in March. So this is simply a table that reflects the cash movements, or it's a snapshot of what's in our cash book or a cash book summary in respect of these respective certain transactions. And if I look at the totals, we've got 15,000 pounds of sales in total for the three months, our cash payments of 10,000 pounds for the three months. We've got no stocks and no creditors, so there's no balance sheet items. So that means our 5,000 pounds of profits are genuinely our real profits. So I'm now going to transfer this to the next spreadsheet and you'll see the first two tables are just the ones we've looked at. I've got them here so you can see it all in one eye shot. But I now want to show how this appears, how these transactions appear in the trial balance so that we can start to see how you account for these movements. And in the process, I'm gonna highlight the balance sheet items. And the idea of this is that you can see how the balance sheet items are used to transfer the costs that are not in the correct accounting period into the correct accounting period so that our costs match with our revenues. So in the month of January, we had cash outflows of 2,000 pounds. So our bank balance minus 2,000 pounds, we credit our bank. And on the face of it, we debit purchases because we purchased a car. So our double entry is correct because our check sum has gone back to zero. And if everything else stayed exactly the same, it would look as if we've lost 2,000 pounds in the month. And it, we've got an overdraft of 2,000 pounds because in this example, we started off with no bank balance. We have an overdraft of 2,000 pounds. But actually we didn't lose 2,000 pounds. This 2,000 pounds actually represents costs in the month of February. I'm just going to show you the February transactions and I'm going to illustrate a bit more what I mean uh, in a minute. In the February transactions, coming back to this table here, we received £15,000 and we paid out £5,000 and net receipt is £10,000. So our net bank balance has gone up by £10,000 plus £10,000 we debit the bank. Happily at the end of February we have £8,000 in the bank. And that represents sales of £15,000, we credit sales, and we debit purchases £5,000. So our £10,000 was made up of sales of £15,000, less purchases of £5,000, debit bank, credit sales £15,000, debit purchases £5,000. Again, our double entry is correct because I'll check some at the bottom of tallies. And in the final month of March, we pay out 3,000 pounds. And again, that represents purchases of 3,000 pounds. Credit bank, debit purchases. So if we don't make any journals and we don't do anything with our uh, balances, this looks like we've got a net cost of 2,000 pounds in the month of January. In the month of February, it looks like we've got net profit of, of £10,000, and in the month of March, it looks like we've got net cash flows and net costs of £3,000. I thought I might make it easier to see what's happening by reflecting the profit and loss account as a separate statement. And this statement comes directly from the trial balance above. So in this case, I've taken the sales and then the purchases to show what the profits are in the period. So, so far, we have the purchase of 2,000 pounds, it looks like we've lost 2,000 pounds in January. It looks like we've made a profit of 10,000 pounds in February and we've lost 3,000 pounds in March. Um, instinctively, we know that can't be correct. So how do we correct the position? Well, what we ideally want to do is to move this 2,000 pounds over to this cost here, or let me put it down in the, in the cash flow position, 
our 15,000 pounds represents the cars we sold in February, but also the costs in January and also the costs in March. So how do we move these two figures, the costs in January and the costs in March into April, into February, so that we've matched the costs against the revenue? And this is the, the answer to this is the balance sheet. What we do is we take these purchases and in reality, we haven't lost the money. Those purchases represent stock. So I'm going to do a journal that says debit stock 2,000 pounds. I'm going to credit purchases 2,000 pounds. So look what's happened here at the end of January. We've got we've no longer got on any costs. And in January, if we look at the totals, we've got no sales, no purchases, because we've moved our purchases into stock and got no gross profit, that's as it should be. So I'm very happy with that. And look at the balance sheet at the end of January. We have stocks of 2,000 pounds, bank balance of minus 2,000 pounds, everything else is nil. So the, the double entry is correct. The balance sheet is correct. The trial balance is correct. As at the end of February, we have some balance sheet items and we no longer have costs which we paid for which relate to a future period so i'm now going to look at the um uh, going to february and in february we use up this stock without any journal entries at the end of february it looks like we've still got stock of two thousand pounds but no we've used up stock £2,000 because we sold the cars, we reduce our stock, we credit our stock by £2,000. What do we debit? We debit purchases. And what we've done using this journal, these two journals, in January, we move the cost up to stock. And in February, we release the stock back to purchases. So that by this mechanism, we've moved the £2,000 that we paid in January into February's profit and loss accounts. So on the face of it, if I look at the profit and loss accounts, I've got my sales of 15,000 pounds. I've now got my purchases of 5,000 in the month. Plus I've added the 2,000 pounds that I spent in January, but it's come through in February. So I've now got 15,000 pounds of revenue, 7,000 pounds of cost. On the face of it, I've got 8,000 pounds of profit. And what I've done is I've used a balance sheet item of stock to shift cost from one accounting period to another. So again, I just reiterate, the balance sheet items are used to shift costs from one accounting period to another so that you can match the period in which your revenues accrue with the period in which your costs accrue. You match your costs with your revenues because that's the only way you can get your correct profit and loss accounts. But I haven't quite finished because at the end of February, I owe 3,000 pounds. And at the moment, this cost of 3,000 pounds that I pay for in March is in the March accounts. And the journal I put through to bring these figures, the future figures through to the future figures through to the current month is to set up a creditor. Because at the end of February, I've actually bought those cars. I've received them. I just haven't paid for them. So at the end of March, at end of February, I have a creditor of three thousand pounds. So if I credit creditors, I have a liability. I credit it. I reduce my overall assets by three thousand pounds. What do I debit? I debit purchases um, because I've already got um, purchases of two thousand pounds. I have to add. 3,000 pounds to it. So now my double entry is correct. If I was doing this correctly, I'd have actually set up a separate journal so that you could distinguish the journal for the stocks from the journal from the creditors. But I wanted to show you the overall effect of this. And what I've done with these two journals is I have brought the 5,000 pounds, both that I paid in January in advance, plus also the 3,000 pounds that I paid in arrears, both of these amounts, I moved them from these respective accounting periods and brought them back into this accounting period. 
So if I now look at my profit and loss account, I show 15,000 pounds of revenue, 10,000 pounds of costs. Finally, I've got the correct profits of 5,000 pounds. And if we look at just the profit and loss account alone, it shows the 15,000 pounds of sales, the 5,000 pounds of purchases, uh, of, purchase, of purchases in the month, plus an additional 5,000 pounds of purchases through journals. So I added together my current month's purchases, plus also the purchases I bought both before and after that relate to the current month, to the month of February. And now if I look at my totals, thankfully they're correct. Now if I look at the March figures, what I haven't yet shown is the journal that these purchases that I paid of 3,000 pounds actually should have really actually paid off my creditor. So if I now show my creditor being, uh, show the reverse this purchases of 3,000 pounds and put it into creditors of 3,000 pounds, the cash flows now eliminate for purchases. And what the net effect of this is, is this payment of 3,000 pounds goes to pay off the creditor. So my, the creditor I had at the end of February has now disappeared at the end of March. And happily, my bank balance shows 5,000 pounds, the 2,000 pounds I paid out in January, plus the 10,000 pounds I received in February, less the 3,000 pounds I paid out in March. So that's all correct. I've got no stock because I've used it up. I've got no creditors because I paid them all off. And my cumulative profit and loss account shows the correct retained profits of 5,000 pounds. And my double entry is correct. I'm now going to show what this looks like on the, um, uh, uh, I'm not going to show the balance sheet. Okay. So, um, so uh, what I've just shown you in this example is the way that we use the balance sheet items to move costs from one period to another accounting period so that you can match your costs with your revenues. And actually, the same applies with revenues, because sometimes you invoice in advance, or sometimes you invoice in arrears. So in February, it could be I invoice somebody for stock I'm going to deliver in March. So that's the opposite of what we just said. If we deliver the costs, the cars in March, but we receive the money in February, we actually need to defer the revenue from February to March, and we just use exactly the same technique of creating a balance sheet item and then transferring it to the following month, we reverse the balance sheet item. And in that way, we bring the costs, uh, the revenues from the correct, from the, the period in which the money was received into the period in to which the goods were actually transferred. Because in accounting terms, if you're selling goods, the period in which you should account for that transaction is the period in which the goods are sold, in which they physically move. And if you're selling time or services, again, the accounting period that you should account for the revenue is not necessarily the month in which you receive the money. The correct accounting period is the period in which that service was delivered. So whatever the cash flows, the correct accounting periods in which you account for transactions are the period in which goods or services are delivered. And if the cash flows are in any other period, you use balance sheet items to correct those positions. So I'm now going to give a second example. Um, and the second example, which I've pre-filled, um, I just want to illustrate this reasonably quickly, is we've bought a fixed asset of 30,000 pounds. This is back to the kitchen example. And we might have bought a lot of plates or an oven or whatever the fixed asset is that we bought. We bought it for 30,000 pounds on the 31st of January. And we sold it for 5,000 pounds on the 30th of November. So over a 10 month period, the cost of our assets has dropped by 25,000 pounds. So over a 10 month period, the cost per month is two and a half thousand pounds. So I just want to illustrate what I'm talking about. 
I've paid out £31,000 on the 31st of January, the accounting, the cash flow all happens on that one month. But the cost accrues over a 10 month period because we know how much we're selling it for. And what we have to do with our accounting transactions is to account for the two and a half, uh, for the 25,000 pounds that we, uh, uh, that we, that it costs us, account for that over the whole of the period. And the reason why we spread it over that period is because the cost of the plates or the reduced cost of the oven are cost against the revenues we've got for selling our food. So in this case, our cash flow is that we spend the whole of the money, the whole of the 30,000 pounds in the month of January, at the end of January. But each month we spend two and a half thousand pounds. That's the cost, even though our cash flow all happens in January. So we're going to use the same mechanism of balance sheet items. And just to describe what happens is, when we purchase this item, we call it month zero. Month zero is the accounting geeky way of saying what happens at the very beginning of an accounting period. So month zero is actually technically a day, but month one is the first month, then month two is the second month. So as at the end of January or the 1st of February, we just paid 30,000 pounds, the cash flow goes out of 30,000 pounds, but we want to allocate two and a half thousand pounds towards our profit and loss accounts, towards our costs in the month. And if we do so at the end of the month, we've got 27 and a half thousand pounds left from our 30,000 pounds. So at the beginning of month two, that 27,000 pounds, which is the same as the figure at the end of month one, if we look at month two in isolation, we start off with unused 20, uh, cash flow of 27,000 pounds or fixed asset of, 20, of a net value of 27,000 pounds. We reduce costs in the month of February by a further 2,000 pounds and we put that to the profit and loss account. And our balance sheet at the end of the month is 25,000 pounds. So we're using the balance sheet item, the balance sheet of the, of the fixed assets, the value of the fixed assets. We're using that as the mechanism to allocate two and a half thousand pounds a month to our profit and loss account. So if we go to our trial balance. In this example, we start off at the beginning of the January with nothing. In the month of January, our owner injects 50,000 pounds to the bank. We use 30 of the 50,000 pounds to buy kitchen equipment. Instead of putting that to sales or costs, we put the whole of that 30,000 pounds to a balance sheet item to fixed assets, to kitchen equipment, because this is the mechanism by which we're going to release costs in future months. So at the end of January, we haven't yet used up any of the kitchen equipment because we only bought it on the 31st of January, but we've got fixed assets of 30,000 pounds. Our bank balance has got down to 20,000 pounds, and that's represented by our owner's equity of share capital of 50,000 pounds. Now in the month of February, there's various costs, and I've just represented those by XXX. I don't really want to go into the detail. What I do want to look at is how we've used this balance sheet item in order to release costs of two and a half thousand pounds in the month of February. And the way we've done it is we create a journal. It's a depreciation journal where we reduce our fixed assets by two and a half thousand pounds. I'm gonna go back to the previous sheet this is this month of February. This is, we've decided that the 30,000 pounds, two and a half thousand, because of this table we created up here, two and a half thousand should go to the profit and loss account. So coming back to the trial balance, we reduce kitchen equipment by two and a half thousand pounds, and we allocate it to costs, to our cost of sales of two and a half thousand pounds. We've got our double entry, it balances, so I'm very happy with that. I've got my audit trail. Somewhere I would show how I arrived at that two and a half thousand pounds. And at some way that would have to relate back to the previous spread, uh, sheet that the journal would somehow relate to this figure so that you could see how that two and a half thousand pounds was arrived at. That's the audit trail. And what this shows is our cash outflow of 30,000 pounds was carried forward as a balance sheet item 
we used up two and a half thousand pounds. At the end of February, we carry forward a further 27,000 pounds of the 30,000, but we've released two and a half thousand pounds to our profit and loss account. We've now used this mechanism of creating a balance sheet item to allocate this 30,000 pounds in the first month, two and a half thousand of that 30,000 pounds is allocated in the month of February. And I now go to March and exactly the same thing happens. We start off with the 27 and a half thousand pounds. I'm now going to look at the March trial balance. And again, there's a various cash book entries. Oh, I should call that cash book. Got various cash book entries. And here again, in the month of March, we're going to have another accounting journal. And the accounting journal for March is another two and a half thousand pounds. This is not the same two and a half thousand pounds because this is the first month. This is the allocation in the second month. Even though the amount happens to be the same, it's actually a different two and a half thousand pounds. Because look, at the end of the period, our 27 and a half thousand pounds has reduced again back to 25,000 pounds. But in the month of March alone, we've allocated the two, two and a half thousand pounds down to our costs, down to our cost of sales. And as at the end of March, we've reduced our fixed assets by 25, uh, down to 25,000 pounds. We've released 5,000 pounds to the profit and loss account. And if we look at the cumulative profits, there's our 5,000 pounds that we've released to the balance sheet. And I just want to show what the balance sheet looks like as a result of all those transactions. The balance sheet, and these figures come directly from the trial balance, the balance sheet is simply a reformat of the trial balance, the balances of a trial balance. So our kitchen equipment was, has gone down to 25,000 pounds. That's the 25,000 pounds here. Our fixed assets in total are 25,000 pounds. Our bank balance had gone down to 20,000 pounds. It shows, it shows here as 20,000 pounds in our current assets. In this particular balance sheet, we've got no other assets or liabilities. So we've got net assets of 45,000 pounds, 25,000 pounds of fixed assets, and 20,000 pounds of current assets, in this case, bank balance. And that represents the owner's capital, share capital of 50,000 pounds, less a loss of 45,000 pounds. And because our debits and credits equal each other, we've got a net debit of uh, assets of 45,000 pounds, net credit to the owners of 45,000 pounds, because in this slightly quirky example, we pretend or deem that this money is what we owe back to the owners. So this is the balance sheet, and you'll notice that in a balance sheet, the profit and loss account is actually reduced to a single entry. So we have a profit and loss account where we split out this total profits into all the different sales, all the different costs. And we've looked at that format in previous weeks, but in the balance sheet, we just summarize it all in total, bring back to a retained profit. That's the amount of profits we have not distributed back to the uh, uh, shareholders. In this case, it's a loss because we're just looking at the depreciation. And we, owe, we now only owe 45,000 back to the owner because we've lost 50,000 of their money. But I want to say one final thing, and that's a, the conventional balance sheet actually does not show the owner's amounts as being a debt due to the owner. So even though I've explained it that way to help you understand it, the conventional format takes the net assets exactly as we've described them. It's just it creates a separate section for owners, uh, the, the, owner, the equity that's owned to owners. But instead of showing the owner's equity as a negative amount, it shows it as a positive amount. And instead of showing costs and sales back to front, instead of showing sales as negative and costs are positive, it shows a net profit that if you have a profit, it shows as positive. And if you have costs, it shows as negative. So the reason they do this is it's much more instinctive to recognize that we've lost money so that's minus 55,000 pounds. And then the 50,000 pounds feels much more comfortable. 
to say they share capital of 50,000 pounds. So in a conventional balance sheet, we simply switch around the debits and credits in this section here. And from now on, whenever I show a balance sheet, I'm always going to show this correct, more conventional format. Just so you know, you simply have to switch it around because it makes much more sense to people who don't understand accounts. So welcome back. Thank you for uh, listening to these concepts of the balance sheet items. I've gone through quite a laborious, I've labored the point quite extensively about what balance sheet items are all about. And the reason is that the balance sheet items are probably one of the most significant features in accounting that will help you pick up if you've got errors and how to correct them. So in the rest of this course, uh, we're going to introduce what computer accounts are because it takes a lot of the legwork out of the mechanics of what we've been doing. But once we've talked about the computer accounts, we're going to go through each of the individual balance sheet items one by one, because that's the way that you're going to create uh, a, a full understanding of what's going on in the accounts so that you can present accounts to your managers, or if you're running the business yourself, that you can understand what the accounts mean so that you now no longer know just what your uh, profit and loss accounts are, but you also start to have a really good understanding of what your net assets are, your total assets and your total liabilities are, so you can start to predict your cash flows to see if you have enough money to meet your business needs in the future. And the balance sheets has this wonderful opportunity of showing you what your net assets and liabilities are so that you can firstly identify if you've made any errors in your profit and loss account, but also you have this fantastic guide to help you forecast what your cash flows are going to be in the coming years. So thank you for listening. Congratulations yet again on such huge progress you've made. This is now quite advanced concepts we're talking about. I don't think it's going to be long before you start feeling confident and you are competent to run books of accounts for other people or for yourself. Thank you for listening. Until next week, bye.